Wow. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> you are the best. You are the best. Wow. You may be seated. Wow, what a story. What an amazing story. You know, God gave me the vision, but you guys pulled it off. And it wasn't about me. It was about all of you guys. And, and just hearing the vision, you got busy and made it happen. And, and God is doing great things. You need to give yourself a big hand tonight. You are the best. The best on the planet. Wow. You know, God is doing some great things. You already sense in this conference uh, what God is doing. And, and David Hughes, you brought your best today, last night. Wow. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. And you know, David, I think those were my two all-time favorite messages. I just, I mean, they were incredible. And, and that's what I love about bringing in uh, pastors like this is that they come, they love people, they love you. Uh, they come very, very prepared. And, and that's what it's all about. And then, uh, then also I want to say that this is kind of rare for, for our family. Uh, I have two brothers, and all three of us are in the ministry. I pastor here. I have Ronnie that pastors in Amarillo, and then I have a brother that is a missionary uh, in, in Mexico and, and works out of Amarillo, and they're both here tonight. And guys, it is great having you guys here, man. Great honor, honor. And so we're going to have a great time tonight. And, you know, I want to talk to you on the subject of you can't kill a dream. You can't kill a dream. You know, dreams are a strange thing. Because at night when you lay down in bed and you drift off to sleep, what do you do? You dream. During the day, as busy as that day is, and you have a pause for a moment, the moment there is a pause in your day, your mind begins to drift, and what do you do? You daydream. And what we find is that we dream throughout the day and we dream throughout the night because there is a dream nature placed in every side, inside of every one of us. And what I want tonight is to dedicate this message to all the people that are sitting in this auditorium that have a dream, yeah. and the dream hasn't yet come to pass. Yeah. Because tonight, I want you to understand something, that the God in my life is the God in your life. Yeah. And the God in the Old Testament is the God in your life. And the God that you read about in the New Testament is the God in your life. And I want to talk about dreams. You know, if you have a dream tonight and that you're dreaming about something that you're able to achieve in your own power. It's not a God dream. But it's when you dream something that is so impossible and so ridiculous that you have a hard time even speaking the dream to your family members and friends because you know they'll roll their eyes and, and they'll mock you and make fun of you because it's so out of reach and it's so ridiculous. That is what a God dream is all about. You know, dreams are what have shaped the world. Whenever you think about dreamers, you think about the Wright brothers who had a dream in flying and we have aviation today. You also find that there was Alexander Graham Bell that had a dream of communication. Today we have cell phones. You have someone else like a Steve Jobs who had a dream and, and he changed how we live. And you have Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who had a social dream and it changed America. And you see the power of a dream, the power of just one man, one woman who has a dream that can change everything and every way that we live. You see, God is the God of dreams. And God gives us dreams for one reason. And the reason why he gives you a dream is that you might change something. It's all about change. That you might change your life, change your family, change your marriage, change a generation. But it's all about changing something and when you think about change there are so many people that never change because they get locked into their past and they never really prepare for the future and you know you can't change what happened yesterday and when you think about yesterday you are who you are today because of what you did yesterday and the only way to have a better tomorrow is to change something today you know, God wants to do something in my life and in your life, and, and it just takes a heart of, of desire and willing to allow God to do something in your life because there's a dream nature inside of every one of us. I want us to look at Genesis chapter 37, and it's about a dreamer, Joseph. Many of us know this story very, very well, but in Genesis 37, I want to give you the family 
tree, the history here, and the family tree is, it starts off with Abraham, and Abraham has Isaac, and Isaac has twin sons, Esau and Jacob, and then Jacob has 12 sons, and his youngest son at the time is Joseph. And it says that Jacob loved Joseph more than all the other brothers, and that may sound unfair, but then it goes on to say because he had him in his old age, and he loved Joseph and it says that he gave him a gift. He gave him a coat. And famously, it's known as the coat of many colors. And when he gave him this coat, it was rare. It, it was an array of colors. And it was expensive. And, and it was beautiful. And it's a coat that only royalty wore. Now, all the other brothers had coats. They had outer garments. But they were off-white. They were merely functional there was nothing special about those coats, but the coat, in contrast to what Joseph had, it was a coat of royalty. It was a coat of favor from the father. Can you imagine this 17-year-old where he's the least in the family, the youngest in the family, and he has never really gained any respect from anyone, and they're always pushing him around, mocking him, making fun of him, but then he goes in and he puts on the coat of royalty. He puts on the coat of favor that the Father has given to him. And all of a sudden you find that when he walks out in front of the, bo the brothers that he now looks like royalty and he feels like royalty and he begins to walk like royalty because he has the favor of God upon his life. And the same way when you think about how that God will pick you out of a crowd and wrap you in His favor that He begins to wrap you in that, that favor that He offers to you, and you can't help but celebrate what God is doing in your life, and others can't help but see what God has done in your life. What I have found is that, that those who are greatly favored by God greatly dream. And the Bible says that Joseph had a dream. Joseph had a dream, and he was in a field, and it was a field, a wheat field, and, and as he stood in the middle, he found that all of the wheat began to bow, and it all began to bow at his feet. And the meaning of the dream was that one day God would give him authority over the harvest. And if there's ever been a time that, that we as a church need to rise up and turn our eyes and turn our attention to the lost, it's now when our nation has lost its direction. You know, whenever you think about what Jesus said, He told us in John 4, 35, He said, if you'll open your eyes and look the fields, look at the fields, look at the fields, He was telling us, because it is ripe for the harvest. What He's telling us is if we will just turn our attention to the lost outside of these walls, there are people that are ready, people that are hurting, people that are in need, and they're in need of you and your words. And, that's, and the reason why that the harvest is so important is because one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And at that moment, for many, it's too late because the eternal destiny has already been set and our time is running out to make a difference. Whatever you think about a dream that God's dropping in your heart, remember this, that a God dream is always connected to the harvest. No matter what you dream, no matter what God drops into your heart, it is always, always connected to the harvest. I was sitting in a meeting, it was a round table of pastors about 15 or 20, not too many months ago, and I was sitting beside a couple of pastors, and one pastor at a church of 1,000 people, and the one next to him pastor at a church of 100 people. I overheard their conversation, and the pastor who pastored 100 people turned to the other, and he said, one day I want to pastor a church like yours. One day I want to pastor a large church. And the pastor commented back and said, why do you want to pastor a, char a large church? Why do you want a church like mine? And the pastor who pastored 100 people went absolutely silent, didn't know what to say, could not respond. And I want to tell you, that if you can't answer the why to your dream, your dream will never come true. Whenever you think about a dream, you're thinking about a dream that, that I want to be a business owner. I want to be a millionaire by the time I'm 30. I, I, want, I, want, I, want, some, this, I want a promotion. I want, I want to move up the ladder. I want this. And, and you have to answer the why to that because if you've never answered the why, God is never going to allow a God dream to begin to grow in you when it's all about self-consumption and self-centered. Because a dream is never about you, but it's about God working through you to change something in the world. You see, your dream is bigger than you. 
In Genesis 37 and verse 5, Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. They hated him all the more because of the dream. Do you realize that not everyone is going to be happy about your dream? Whenever you start dreaming and you start thinking about breaking out of the mold and breaking out of the, the status quo and, and where you want to break out of that neighborhood poverty mentality and where you want to stop running with losers and all of a sudden you say, I'm not running with those kinds of people but I'm going to seek out and run with those who are winners and those who are dreamers. All of a sudden you will find that there will be many who will hate you and they will hate your dream. And Joseph in verse 18, and when they saw him afar off, they conspired against him, and they said, here comes the dreamer. Here comes the dreamer. They didn't even call him by his name. They called him by his dream. And I want to tell you that, that many times when you think about the dream, how powerful the dream is, there may be many times that, that they may forget you, they will forget your name, but they will never forget your dream. Because your dream is not of human nature, your dream is supernatural given to you by God. And the dream is never about you. But it's about always standing in the shadow of the one who has given you the dream and proclaiming His name, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. It's not about my name and your name, it's about His name. Yeah. In verse 20, as we go on, but they said that we should kill Him and tell Father that a wild beast has devoured Him and we shall see what has become of His dream. We shall see. They were smart enough to believe that the dream could come true. But they were dumb enough to believe that they could stop the dream. Because I want to tell you, there is not a demon in hell that can stop the dream that God has placed in your life. Nothing can stop your dream. Nothing can stop your dream. When they stripped him of his coat and they stripped him of what they saw as the Father's favor, the very thing that they hated in his life and they threw him in a pit, it was a pit that was dry and it was barren, it was lonely, it was dusty. And when he landed at the end of this pit... It was the end of his dream facing death. And many of you know exactly what that feeling is when you think about your dream and that you've come to a place that is so dry and so barren and there is no hope and you've come to the end of your dream, the death of a dream. But I want to, re I want to remind you of something, that a dream is always a journey. And the dream that God drops in your heart, that it will always be in three stages. There is the birth of a dream, there will be the death of a dream, and there will be the resurrection of a dream. And every dream that is given by God will go through a testing time. Every dream will walk through the valley of death. And every dream will hit the wall of impossibilities. And it's at that moment when you believe that your dream has absolutely died. It was eight years ago when we were dreaming of, of leaving our, our place our, where we were meeting at that time in our current property where we had four acres, a small building, couldn't build anything else there. We were landlocked and we knew that staying there that we had no great future of expansion. And so as we begin to dream and talk and, and, and we were hoping that, that someday we could move from that property, we entered into a capital campaign and, and it was a small gathering of people at that time and, and I've never seen people sacrifice at that level. And, and the people of our church, they rallied together and they gave and they gave and they sacrificed and three long, grueling years, we raised one million dollars and we were well on our way. It was where we put our building up for sale, and, and it was up for sale for seven long years, and not one offer was placed on that building. We had talked to architects and builders and consultants, and, and we told them what we wanted to build, that we were dreaming of finding property and building, and they worked, and they worked, and they worked, and every time we came back with a drawing that we were always somehow $3 million short of even getting started. It took us three years to raise one million dollars. We need three million. That's another nine years of nothing but fundraising. We ended up buying property, 12 acres of land, and it was over a period of time that we were so excited and throwing money at it and throwing it at architects and trying and trying and trying, and the land that we bought ended up being an absolute nightmare. And we had to end up giving the land back to the owners, and it didn't work. On top of all of that, then there was the 2008 financial crisis, and everything came caving in. And it's when 
the church board myself realized that we had hit a wall of impossibility and the dream had died and we pulled the plug. And I can remember walking into my office that morning, devastated. In all of these years in fundraising and working and working, instead of moving forward, we'd gone backwards. The million dollars that we had raised was almost gone. Everything that we had, the land that we had purchased, it was gone. And I sat in my office thinking, how can a dream go so bad? How can a dream die like this? And sitting there that day, wiping tears, I pulled out a page, a piece of paper, and I began to write myself a letter. When I finished writing the letter, I folded it up and put it in an envelope, and I sealed it up and dropped it into my desk. And there that envelope, sealed envelope, stayed for three years. After three years... I went back and picked up that sealed envelope and I walked into the atrium of this building. It was late on a Friday night when no one was here and the next day was grand opening of this building. Standing in that atrium all by myself, I broke the seal of the envelope and I pulled out the letter that I had written and I want to read to you what I wrote that day when everything was so bleak. At the top of the page, I said, my great hope in God. Today is April 15th, 2008, and it's a day of deep discouragement for me. The dream of relocating seems to have come to an end, and we have raised $1 million over the last three years, and we need at least another $3 million just to get started. The economy has crashed, building has completely stopped in our city, and no one is loaning money. There's no answers and no solutions. All I know is that Ephesians 3.20 says, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I ask or think according to the power within us. I wrote under that verse that God says that whatever I can imagine, He can outdo. So here's my dream. My dream is that our current property will sell at asking price. My dream is that we will build a building at least 60,000 square feet. My dream is that, that we will receive a $3 million cash gift. And then I went on. Everything about this project seems impossible. Every builder, every architect, every realtor says it can't be done with our budget. The dream is now out of reach of my human abilities, and fear wants to overtake me. But I have not been created to fear. God is able. If God stopped the sun for Joshua, parted the Red Sea for Moses, and shut the mouth of the lions for Daniel, then He can perform this miracle for us. And today, and today I declare by faith that this will happen. The next time that I read this letter, I'll be standing in the miracle that I have dreamed of, and I will stand amazed at how God did it. What I do not see today I will, I will see. Our God is an amazing God. Our God, when the Bible describes Him as a God who will do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Listen to this. When I stood there that day in my office, sitting there and writing that letter and tears streaming down my face, I said, God, we need asking price for this building. It had been up for sale for seven years. And we got asking price, which was a ridiculous price for that building. When I asked for 60,000 square feet that had pushed me as far as I could dream, God didn't give us 60,000 square feet. He gave us 100,000 square feet. Whenever I ask God, that God on this day that I see nothing and everything has come to a dead end and nothing is working and I mean, we have come to the death of a dream, I was asking God for a $3 million cash offering. And God didn't give us $3 million. God gave us a $6 million miracle. God is an amazing God in how that, that God will do what we can never, ever do. And I want you to remember something. God is bigger than your problem, and you can never, ever, ever kill a dream. You can't kill a dream. As we continue on in the story, the brothers decided to kill him, but... Out of nowhere came the caravan of the Ishmaelites. Out of nowhere. 
You know, God seems to be the God of out of nowhere. Out of nowhere when the miracle comes. Out of nowhere when God shows up. Out of nowhere and God does it so often. And here in this situation, when Joseph was about to lose his life, out of nowhere, the Ishmaelites show up. Do you remember who they were? Do you remember who the Ishmaelites were? Remember Abraham, great-grandfather of, of, of uh, Joseph? That it was that time, that, that ugly time in his life when he had that oops in his life. You know where he committed adultery? He slept with Hagar, the, the servant, and he was trying to help God out. He was trying to help things move along, and, and they had a son by this servant whose name is Ishmael, and that's where the Ishmaelites came from. But think about this, that this sin of Abraham that was so embarrassing and so degrading, and, and it was so hard on the family, and it devastated Sarah, and it has, has haunted Israel for years. This sin that was so messed up, this sin that Abraham committed, what great-grandfather did, his mistake that he made became grandson's miracle. I want to tell you only God can do that. And the Word of God tells us that, that whatever the devil means for harm is what God can turn for your good. You know, I don't know where you've messed up in life. I don't know how bad things are for you sitting here and you're saying, I don't know, you know, I just don't know because I've messed up and messed up and messed up. God is the master of taking your mess and turning it into an absolute blessing because you can't kill a dream. You can't do it. You can't kill a dream. You know, God will use everything and anything. God will use the secular and God will use the spiritual. God will use the godly and He will use the ungodly. He will use those that are unchurched. He will use the heathen. He'll use anything to further His kingdom. It's amazing to me that the two biggest gifts that we have received in our church, one gift was $250,000. The other gift that we have received is, is a gift of $500,000. But you know what blows me away about that? That both of those gifts were given by men that have never been in one of our services, that have no interest in church whatsoever, that don't serve God at any level, and yet they give the church those kinds of gifts, and it makes no sense to me. But all that I know is that God said that He would use the wealth of the wicked to raise up the righteous, and that God can use anything in anything that He desires in our lives. Always understand that those in the world who believe that they are in control of their lives are nothing but puppets in the hand of God. And that God can use anybody and anything to further your dream. As we continue on in the story that Joseph is taken by the Ishmaelites, sold into slavery in Egypt, and ends up in Potiphar's house. Potiphar has a young wife and she's beautiful and Joseph is attractive and working in the house and she begins to tease with him and flirt with him and she begins to say, Joseph, come and lie with me and come sleep with me. No one will ever know. Come and be with me. And day after day after day, the temptation, and it says that he fled from her. He refused her. When it comes to your dream, remember that the fulfillment of your dream demands integrity. And that if you ever want your dream to move forward, that you've got to move in with, with integrity because, it, you know, all of us have messed up somewhere in our lives and sometimes people mess up so bad, but God's not concerned about your past mess up. But as you're pursuing a dream, be careful. Be careful to operate in integrity because when you mess up, it slows down the process and it moves you back again and we don't have time to move back. Whenever you think about your dream, you've got to protect something that is so precious as a dream and it cannot be played with. And again, what is your dream? When you're thinking about a dream, is it to be to find a husband or to find a wife or you want financial increase, or maybe you've been praying and saying, God, I, I need this scholarship. God, I, I, I've been working so hard on this scholarship, or I need this promotion. But the question is, what you're praying about, can God trust you with that? that? That if you're praying for that, can God trust you by giving what you're asking? Because He blesses where His reputation is protected. And Potiphar's wife was furious that a mere servant would turn her down. 
And he lied about Joseph and had him thrown into prison. But even in prison, you can't kill a dream. Because the Bible says three different times that while he was in prison, God was with him, God was with him, God was with him. And it was while he was in prison that the favor was still upon Joseph. And Joseph, while in prison, he continued to minister to those. He was put in charge of all the other prisoners. He interpreted dreams for other prisoners. And after many, many years of being in prison, Pharaoh had a disturbing dream. And it was a dream that haunted him. And he started asking everyone, who can tell me what this dream is all about? Who can tell me what, it's, what the meaning is? And there was a butler that was working with him that had also once been in prison. And all of a sudden, he remembered Joseph. And he says, I know one that can interpret this dream. They brought Joseph out of prison that day into the palace in front of Pharaoh. And this is the dream that he told. He said, the dream is that I have fat, seven fat cows and seven skinny cows and seven years of plenty and seven years of famine and then death will swallow up the land. And Pharaoh was frightened by the dream. But Joseph stood there knowing that God had given him a dream long ago that he would have authority over the harvest. Pharaoh listened as he spoke, and Pharaoh perceived that he was a wise man and put him in charge of all of the land. In one day, Joseph goes from prison all the way to second in command of Egypt. Only God can do something like that. Here Pharaoh, the king, he perceives that Joseph is a wise man. He perceives that he's a visionary and he's a dreamer. And all of a sudden, Pharaoh wants men like this close to him. Tonight, if you want to be a dreamer, you have to hang out with dreamers. You can't hang out with people that are below you, but you need to hang out with people that are above you that will push you to greater heights. You know, I love history and I love the Titanic. And every time I, I see an article, I've got to stop and I've got to read the article. I mean, I'm absolutely fascinated by the Titanic. And, you know, whenever you look at the story, you know, everyone is amazed at how few people escaped the ship and how few people were, were able to survive. But, you know, when you think about escaping the ship, it's really not true because most of the people escaped from the ship. Most of the people jumped from the ship and they had, they had lifeboats or floating devices floating on something, but most of the people left the ship, jumped out of the ship into the water. But when the ship broke in two, and the end came up, and it began to sink. It created a vortex for all of those who were close around the ship, that they got caught in the vortex, and they were pulled down with the ship, down to their death. In the very same way, when we hang out with people, people that are not leading us and helping us to go in the right way, you will get caught up in their vortex, and they will pull you down to the death of where your dream will never come true. The vortex is what's got to be avoided. And Pharaoh noticed that here is a man of wisdom. Here is a dreamer, and I want him close by. In Genesis chapter 41 and verse 4, and Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. In verses 51 and 52, and Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh, meaning this, that God has made me forget all my troubles and all my father's household. And then he had a second son whose name was Ephraim. And the meaning of his name is that God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. That God has made me fruitful in the land of affliction. You know, the fastest way to kill and to shut down a dream is to refuse to forgive and to forget. When we've been so wounded by people that are close to us, when we've been wounded by a father, a mother, an uncle, a grandfather, and you don't know what they did to me. They have abused me. They've hurt me. They've wounded me. They've devastated me. And you're never able to get past it. Because many hurts and wounds come from one's own household. Yeah. And what we do is we run. 
and we run the rest of our lives. We're running, we're running, we're running, and, and we're just running from church to church and from school to school and from job to job because this person hurt me, they wounded me, they offended me, and, and we're running and running and running and hoping one day that we'll find the land of Oz where dreams come true. But let me tell you, dreams don't come true in the land of Oz. Dreams come true in the land of affliction. And it's when you hang in there, and it's when you fight through that, because every dream will be tested. Very quickly, this is a fascinating thought. In Genesis chapter 12, we know of Abraham as the father of Israel. Abraham was the beginning of that nation. Here in Genesis 12, there's just a statement about Abraham's father that no one hardly ever hears about, and his name is Terah. And here in this story, you find where Terah had three sons, Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran, his youngest son, died at a young age, and he was, he was grieving and agonizing over the death of this young son. We find where Terah rises up out of the city of Ur, and he leaves Ur, and he heads to Canaan, but halfway between Ur and Canaan, there's a little community, a little town. And you know what the name of the town is? Haran, the same as his son. And it says that when Terah was on this journey, that he came to Haran, and he stopped in Haran, and he settled in Haran, and he died in Haran. The next chapter, it picks up with Abraham, the oldest son. And Abraham calls, or God calls to Abraham and says, I want you to leave Ur, and he was sending him to Canaan to become the father of Israel. My question tonight is that, is it possible that God had called Terran to be the father of Israel? But on that journey, he got caught in Haran. He got caught in the place of his past hurts and his wounds and his grief and where he stopped and he settled there and he died there. You see, there are many people that are on a journey and the journey that we're on that we're on the journey of the dream that God had placed in you and somewhere down the line we get caught, we get stuck in the place of pain and grief and agony and we settle there, we stop there, we die there and we never move on because we can't get past our past. You know, there's a dream that is burning in every side, inside of every person. There's a dream. I want to share with you one of my all-time favorite stories, and I want to close with this. There were two college roommates, Fred and Jim. Fred was playing golf for the University of Houston, and his roommate, Jim, was a broadcast journalist major. They were great friends, and, and they were roommates all four years, and, and every night they would have some of their buddies come into their room, and, and they were always horsing around and playing around, and Jim, who was the broadcast major, would grab a hairbrush every night and use it as a microphone, and there he'd, he'd take off, because one day he wanted to be a sports announcer, and he'd say, there's Fred, there's Fred on the 18th green of the Masters. All he has to do is put this one last putt, and if it goes in, he wins, and he puts the ball, and the ball is curving in, and it goes in, and he wins the Masters, and the crowd goes wild. Everyone's screaming. Everyone's shouting and chanting his name, and as he's got the hairbrush, he's saying, and now I see him walking off the 18th green. And they're shaking his hand. They're congratulating him. They're putting a, a check in his hand of a half a million dollars, and there it is. There it is, that iconic green jacket that they put on every winner of the Masters. They're putting that on him right now. And now he's walking up the hill. He's coming right towards us. Maybe we'll get a chance to interview Fred in just a few moments. And then, and then Fred would jump up off the, the bed there in the dorm room and he'd hold the hairbrush over and, and then Fred would take off. I want to thank all the little people out there and then all the people in the dorm room, they'd start throwing things, saying, you guys are idiots, sit down. You guys are nuts, crazy. They did it night after night after night. In April of 1992... Fred, Fred Couples, was on the pro tour. 
and had made it to the Masters, comes down to the 18th green, puts an 18-foot shot, the ball rolls, curves, goes in, and he wins the Masters. He starts walking off the 18th green, and the thousands of people that had gathered around were standing at their feet chanting his name. As he walks off, they shake his hand and congratulate him and hand him a check of a half a million dollars. Then they put on the iconic green jacket, and he puts it on, and it fits just perfect. And then he starts up the hill to be interviewed by CBS, a sports announcer. As he gets to the top of the hill, the sports announcer has the microphone, and it's none other than his old roommate, Jim Nance, is standing there to interview him. You see, that story is not about luck, and it's not about chance, but it's all about being avid. It's all about being passionate about your dream and never letting your dream die. I want to remind you that your dream will always come to a place of death. Because what God will allow it to do is come to the end of human means. And then it turns into a supernatural dream of where God takes it from there and moves on. But what people do is they allow themselves to die because they're convinced that they can't move forward, that everything is impossible, everything is against me, the odds are against me, it'll never take place, I'm not good enough, I'll never add up, I'm not as smart as somebody else, I'm not as talented as somebody else. Remember, a God dream, a supernatural dream, has nothing to do with human ability. It only has to do with your faith and trust in God and just never giving up, never giving up, never giving up, because you can't kill a dream. You can't kill a dream. And I want to tell you tonight, and I want everyone to stand with me for a moment, I want to tell you tonight that, that maybe you're sitting here and, and your heart is aching. I mean, your heart is aching because you have a dream and your dream has not come about. You have a dream and, and the dream has, has never, ever come about. And you're broken. At days, there are days that, that you weep over a broken dream. The dream hasn't come true. We convince ourselves that we've messed up so bad. It's my fault. I messed up. I had a dream, but the dream will never come about. Well, I want to tell you, you can't kill a dream. You can't kill a dream. God's got a dream inside of you, and maybe it's hit that wall of impossibilities. Now turn it over to the supernatural. What some of you need to do is sit down and write out a letter today and seal it up and declare that this is what I'm banking on. This is what I'm believing. This is what I know that God is going to do in my life. Sit down and write out a dream. Declare in the name of Jesus Christ that, that my dream is going to unfold. Because it has nothing to do with how old you are. It has nothing to do with how smart you are. It has to do with the heart that you have for God. You see, God has given you something to work through you to work through you, to change something. God needs you, and He needs your dream to come to pass. I'd like for you to bow your heads for a moment, and I want to pray with you. And I want to pray for those that your heart is aching, that you know what I'm talking about tonight. You hit the wall. You don't know what to do. It looks like there is no hope, but there is hope. And God is the God who can do exceedingly, abundantly above whatever you dream and whatever you think. What do you want tonight? What do you want? And then answer the second question, why do you want it? And how do you connect it to God? And whenever you figure out those two questions is when the heavens open up and begin to do the supernatural. And it begins to speed up faster and faster and faster. What's your dream? Let me pray with you tonight that God's going to break open the dream. Father, I pray for every dream. God, every dream that has come to the place of death. Lord, where I pray for leaders, I pray for pastors. God, I pray for those that are discouraged. God, I, I'm asking that, Lord, for those that feel like they've hit the wall of impossibilities, and Lord, we're in the exact spot where we need to be. Lord, we're at that very moment of a miracle. And Father, I pray that you would break forth the miracle. God, that you would begin to do in their lives what they've never understood. 
Father, I pray that the impossible would begin to take place. That God, that you would begin to shatter the doubt, shatter the excuses. And Lord, today that we just begin to lift our eyes toward you saying that there's a dream, there's a hope, God, that you've put it in my life. It's a God dream. And now, Lord, I declare it in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, that you can do what I cannot do. And so now, Lord, I receive it. I receive it in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Hey, do you believe that tonight? Do you believe that? God is a great, great, great God. Amen. Amen.